Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussions, news, and interviews, presenting the film scene with Ileana Douglas. Ileana is an actress, writer, author, and film historian with a need to discuss movies that borders on obsession. You'll learn the history of movies one great story at a time. The film scene is the deep cuts of movie podcasts, featuring movies we love by the people who made them. And now, Ileana Douglas. Why, hello, welcome to the film scene. Uh, we're live uh, in quarantine at home. Uh, hi, Jeff, how's it going? It's good, I'm improvising a bit today. My computer's a little wonky, so I'm on my phone, so if I sound or look a little different, it's a global pandemic, it needs to be I know, it's the same thing. My, my sound is not great, I understand that, but I'm doing the best I can. Next week, maybe I'll actually invest in uh, headphones. I splurged this week by buying a hard drive. After nice. I, I'm, I, you have to get the right one, you know. It's so I've, just, I've had I've got eighteen thousand hard drives. So we, I want to answer some questions um, before we do. Uh, before we get Jonathan Goldstein on, I just want to recommend this book because of Mother's Day coming up. This is a book I participated in uh, called Mom and the Movies. And it suggests some, you know, some great movies. I, I, of course, wrote about Gypsy. I didn't want to <laughs> do like terms of endearment or, you know, so I wrote about Gypsy, but it, it, it's a great, you know, all, all the great mother movies, Stella Dallas, which they did a remake of, Psycho, sort of a mother's <laughs> I just love, it's the perfect encapsulation of both of our personalities that before air, we were like, we should talk about some recommendations for movies. I was like, oh yeah, like Terms of Endearment. And Ileana's like, how about Gypsy? <laughs> Come on, she's the, she's the mother of all uh, mothers. And Stage moms. The other thing I wanted to mention, just because it fits with moms, is um, Trump's reference of, she was no Donna Reed, which is so fun. What an odd... Wow, we've really, uh, I mean, it was, it just sort of said it all, you know what I mean? For I a, a man to have a reference that he wants women to be like Donna Reed. Now, that's not taking anything away from, you know, Donna Reed was a terrific actress and she was in, you know, films like From Here to Eternity and It's the Wonderful Life. She didn't always play, you know, uh, uh, a housewife, you know, and mom, but it's so funny that that's his, his idea of, of what the perfect woman is. So fitting with Mother's Day. You know, uh, yes. Perfect. We could also um, recommend any Mommy Dearest. That's a, a, an upbeat film. Definitely. And if you want to do Mommy Dearest, you know, I love to recommend movies uh, and movie books. This is a fantastic book called Conversations with Joan Crawford. It's very, very juicy. She did this towards the end of her life. It's written by Roy Newquist. And she did this sort of towards the end of her life. So probably over some Pepsis and vodka. So she spills a, <laughs> lot, of, she spills a lot of beans. And then speaking of Gypsy, my other book recommendation is uh, notice I'm, I'm gonna try, I should have a book probably in this century, but uh, Life is a Banquet by Rosalind Russell, who is the star of uh, of Gypsy and I, also from Connecticut. So um, I want to recommend that that book. Love Let's it. take some questions before we get Jonathan on here. Yeah, a lot of the questions are directed at Jonathan, but we can get Great. one in advance of the interview. I'll be curious to see what you think of this because Ileana, you're very funny. You're a comedy writer. Uh, you're a uh, multifaceted genre writer, but everything you write has elements of comedy in it. Definitely. Curious about what you think of this tweet, and we'll ask Jonathan as well. This comes from Hannah Karlovich, who says, one thing I want to know is why do authors of comedy scripts always structure everything about learning lessons? Why not have a situation be funny and have characters come to the, quote, wrong conclusion about what's happened to them? Is moral structure really necessary in a comedy strip? Well, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, to me, you have to go back. Uh, it depends on the comedy. You know, if you go back to, to Charlie Chaplin, he didn't really have a more, you know what I mean? He, he, he was a different type of comedy. So it was really Charlie Chaplin up against society, kind of. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They, they, it was their persona. Um, if you look at, because I'm a big Ernest Lubitsch fan, his movies 
did not have any kind of more any kind of lesson. They were all they were always about the class system, you know, which is sort of interesting. Falling in love with someone that wasn't in your class, so that's something interesting to look at. I feel like it's a more modern thing that we include a lesson. As I'm thinking of, you know, some of my favorite movies by people like Albert Brooks, comedies, Albert Brooks, Mel Brooks, Elaine May, Mike Nichols, they don't really have as much of a kind of a teaching moment. I, I feel like, and this is just maybe a guess. I know that when I was uh, doing some writing uh, w around the period that I met Jonathan um, back in the early aughts, it was very important for the studio, for your character to have redeeming qualities, you know. Likeable, right? Yeah, so that may be where that comes from. I don't particularly agree with it. I think you should write what you want to write and not get bogged down with notes in, unless you have to. And if you get a note, you should figure out a way to try to make it organic. Okay. Well, a lot of my favorite comedies also don't necessarily lean on morals. I mean, I love Seinfeld, and of course, that show was famously about learning nothing. Like, that was the thesis statement that that writing staff had, was like, if the characters learn anything, we've messed up on this episode. And um, I feel the same way about Arrested Development, which of course stars Jason Bateman. Um, or what that show did, I think, was sort of subvert the idea of a lesson, like the characters would learn a lesson the wrong way, which I always thought was kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I'm a big Jason Bateman fan. We'll have to talk with Jonathan about him. Yeah, so I love I love Jason. He's so, he's so he's got a whole underplaying quality with his uh, with his comedy that is excellent. Great straight yeah. man. Yeah, particular timing. I know there was a question. Somebody was asking me about the Netflix uh, show Hollywood. I think. Uh, yes, 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 yes. This comes from Patrick at Patrick J Seals. Hi, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, he says, "What are your thoughts on Hollywood?" Uh, the Netflix show created by Ryan Murphy, of course. A lot of historians hate it, and I can understand why. Have you seen it? Uh, I have. I started to watch it, and I had the same reaction. I it, I was chafing a little bit at the reinterpretation of actual events and actual people. Um, you know, to take Rock Hudson's story, it's uh, Anna May Wong's story. Um, I don't know. It was it was like they borrowed from various Tab Hunter, uh, his story. It's as if they borrowed from some elements and put it in a narrative and made people think that this is what really happened and that's not necessarily the case. So I I found that a little cringy. You know, going back to movies, I mean, you know, in the old days, Greer Garson was you know, playing Madame Curie, and it wasn't exactly factual, but they didn't add things that made you kind of question the, the person. Um, and so there are details that are that I saw depicted that are not uh, necessarily true, and I don't know where they, they borrow those uh, narratives from. When I write about people, I make absolutely sure that what I'm writing about them is completely accurate and then I may add my own personal opinion or essay about it but I always differentiate um, between that and it troubled me I know one big thing that somebody mentioned is you know they have a woman as a, being a head of a studio and they don't mention that Alice Guy Blachet actually ran a, the head of a studio so those are the big uh, sort of issues that I that I had with it because you worry that if you want to do the anime Wong story, you know, that, oh, well, it, we already saw it in, um, in this mini series. So it, it, yeah. it, so that was my, my, uh, my feeling about it. I was, I was disappointed at the lack of authenticity. Sorry. Well, what's interesting is Ryan Murphy has gotten it right before. I mean, we both love you, which is of course the Joan Crawford, Betty Davis, miniseries portrayed by Susan Sarandon and, um, wow, Jessica oh, Lang. Jessica Lang, yeah. Thank but, you, and- um, But once again, he's being sued by Olivia de Havilland for you know. fictionalizing her part of the story. Yeah. Now, you know, that's a big boo-boo. How, how do you just blatantly write about somebody that is alive and put stuff that's not factually accurate about it? Yeah, that's true. So 
I don't know, I find that I'm blanking on the name, but there was a very famous book about, um, you know, the guy, this guy who, he wrote a book that, you know, about working at a gas station, supposedly he serviced all the movie stars. Now I'm blanking on the name of it, but there's a narrative in the, in the show that borrows heavily from that book. And that guy is dead. And they didn't, since they didn't make a movie on his story, I'm sort of curious how they can borrow that entire narrative huh. and, and put it in a, you know, w without crediting that it was actually this other guy's story. And forgive me for not knowing the name of it. But. I think that's full service by Scotty Bowers. Exactly, the Scotty Bowers story. Pardon me for not knowing that. But uh, yeah, so the Dylan McDermott character is, that's, I was watching it and I said, hey, wait a minute, that's the Scotty Bowers story. So mm -hmm. that's the part where you chafe a little bit because, you know, how, how do the relatives of, of that guy feel? Anyway, is there another question before we get on to Jonathan? A lot of Jonathan focused questions. Um, okay, great. Just... We'll, We'll save them up. Should we get on to Jonathan? Let's, we've had enough of me. Let's bring him in. Let's bring him in. Okay. Well, let me just give a nice little intro to Jonathan because I'm so excited to see him. Uh, after a stint as a lawyer, uh, Jonathan pursued a career in comedy. And since then, his name has become synonymous with high profile and profitable studio comedies like Horrible Bosses, Vacation, The Incredible Burt Wonderstone, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, and of course, Game Night. And uh, we're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons coming up too. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Goldstein. Hello. Hi, Jonathan. How are you? I'm, uh, well, I'm excellent. It's been a long time. We haven't, uh, to clue me in on what you've been up to since we met. It's since 2000, since July of 2004. Oh my God, that was a long time ago. It was. It was. Uh, that, was a, that was a very surreal trip. Yes, so before we get into your career, let's go down memory lane and, and, and talk about when we met in the summer of 2004, when I was, I was writing a, a, a pilot for New Line. That's right. Um, and my agent called and said, uh, Ileana Douglas wants you to fly to Pittsburgh to meet with her. Uh, I didn't know why you're in Pittsburgh, but um, I, said, I said, okay. I clapped it. <laughs> and so, so I flew there and I remember getting picked up in a stretch limousine at the airport, wow. but it wasn't actually, it felt like a, a stretch limousine from like 20 years before. Yeah. It, past its prime I couldn't like open the window that I think the handle fell off inside the stretch limo so I kind of felt good but not great about myself when I arrived yeah. um and then I got to see you and Jeff Goldblum do uh music man on stage yeah and that was crazy and that was a I mean you're one of the privileged few to see that experience now this is we were shooting a movie like a uh, of do of us being in the show. So we had, we we're doing the movie, but then we were also really doing the show. And right. there's a lot of behind the scenes drama. Okay. Uh, what happened? It was on oxygen. Did it make it? No, the, uh, there was a lot of behind the scenes drama um, that I was having. And I never could pinpoint without naming names who it was. I have a feeling was this one guy from New Line just, he and I just did not um, sync up. Mm. And if I ever wanted someone, then that, then, you know, man, but I used to think, do I not know enough about showbiz? Like if you say, oh my God, the meeting went so great. He's awesome. He totally understands me. Like, should I not have said that? Probably not. Yeah. Cause yeah. that's the next thing I knew. They were shoving someone down my throat that I was like, oh, uh, okay. But I don't know. It was a total mystery to me because I thought you were great and we got along great. Yeah. But I told this guy and then the next thing I never heard. heard. <laughs> it's weird. You know, it's it's a strange thing because I, obviously I spent a lot of my career at New Line in the, on the feature side of things. Yeah. They gave us our first. They bought my first spec. When I say our, I'm talking about my partner, John Francis Daly. Um, yeah. They bought our very first spec script. 
um, which was called the $40,000 man, which was about the guy they built before they had the money for the $6 million man. And, uh, it was a very funny script. It got us on the blacklist, which is that thing they put out every year where they say their favorite scripts. Uh, and Jim Carrey came on board uh, and they hired a director who decided to rewrite it and it was a total mess and it went away. Uh -huh. and still hasn't been seen the light of day, but since then, got our foot in the door. So. Wow. Well, that's, yeah, we well, did. I, I, I had a, it was a, we, we had a lot of problems. I mean, I had, I got all these, I got Jeff Goldblum. I got, I got fought on every, it was very wearying. Every decision I made, yeah. I got fought on every, every editor. It was like. And that's true of television generally. It's, it's a it's, very, I mean, because I'm now, we, my partner and I and his wife actually uh, had a pilot picked up at CBS, which is was supposed to shoot the pilot uh, with uh, with Elizabeth Hurley and mm -hmm. Hannah Simone about now three weeks ago. Obviously, that didn't happen. But yeah. the notes you get in television are very uh, thorough. Let's put it that way. Yeah, the, yeah. We, I, 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 it, but casting every and we had, um, uh, I, there was an you know the, the, the every. Every time I liked someone, they would come in and say, no, you can't have that person. Except for Jeff Goldblum. They were happy that I, and oh, the other reason before moving on, the reason that I, part of the reason that I was doing the show in Pittsburgh was that Jeff said that if I did the show, he would do my pilot. Mm -hmm. So I thought I had the golden ticket, you right. know, like since when does Jeff Goldblum do a comedy pilot? But it was off or not. Um, anyway, but yeah, so I want to talk about your early days working. And after you wrote the script, did you move on to? Uh, do you worked in television. You worked with Gina Davis and Eddie Murphy, Julie Louis Dreyfus. Did you enjoy those experiences, or did you feel hemmed in? No, I enjoyed most of it. Um, I had come from before the TV stuff. I was a lawyer. And yeah. so I, I went to law school at Harvard Law and I had the full you know, experience. I graduated and I went to work at a big New York law firm, partly because I had $85,000 in debt when I came out and partly because they offered me a job paying like six figures at age 27. And I was like, yeah, all right, I'll try that. But it was a miserable life. I just from day one, I hated it. The people were kind of burned out from the start and there was just no joy anywhere. So after two years, I quit and I moved to LA with just a couple spec scripts and um, was fortunate enough to get an, a manager and an agent within a few months of coming out. And then I got on a show and then I basically just went from show to show on the writing staffs. Usually, like you mentioned, high profile star driven shows that lasted one season. Uh, <laughs> Nathan Lane, Gina Davis, Hank Azaria. I mean, just, you know, year after year. So it was frustrating because most of them didn't survive, but after being a lawyer and then getting to be a writer for money, you know, that's as good as it gets, I think. So then how, and then, so how did you start then you, were you, were, were you on your own then or did you, were you working with your partner? I did not know, John and I didn't, didn't partner up until we started doing features. Um, I, I actually met him, he was an actor on the Gina Davis show playing the, the teenage son, he's a bit younger than I am, but he reminded me of myself at that age and then, we had this idea for a script and we decided let's try and write it together. Um, and since movies are a, a more in-depth process in terms of the writing, it takes a longer time to get it done. It felt good to have somebody else to do it with. And then we just started clicking. Do you think the writing as a partner is easier dealing with a studio than writing on your own? Yeah. If it's a, if it's an effective partnership, I think it is because it's the two of you. Right. Offering each other opposite the executives you don't always win but i think it right. helps yeah yeah you have to watch your facial expression though when the right. guy said I would, yeah. I wouldn't be good at that like <laughs> you want to do what um so you um which came first does horrible bosses come before vacation yeah Somebody? yes uh bosses was the first movie we had we got made um which was very exciting yeah, you had an all-star cast with that. It was an all-star cast. I remember being, I was on vacation with my family in London, and I remember my agent called and saying, we've got Jennifer Aniston, um, uh, Kevin Spacey, you know, before. When he was yes. Kevin Spacey. Um, 
and uh, and Jennifer Aniston and, and uh, uh, who else is in that movie? Uh, was Colin, that the Colin Farrell? Um, yeah, and, Colin Farrell's yeah. incredible. I wish he'd do more comedy. Actually, let's start with Colin Farrell. For for Jennifer Aniston, again, she was. I think she, this was like her period where she was trying to reboot her image, and yeah. it really worked. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, we thought we were going to have to tone down some of the raunchier stuff we wrote for her because she was America's sweetheart. But she loved it. She was like, "No, no, give me more." <laughs> she wanted the raunch. And how did you get Colin Farrell? Because he's. He's well, again a highlight. His hair is awesome. Yeah, yeah. He well, he wanted that. He wanted the fat, the suit, and the and the bald cap and stuff. Um, I think a lot of actors who are used to playing very serious stuff, they love it when somebody offers them a comedy. Yes. Uh, we had that with when we did Game Night and we called up Kyle Chandler. He was just like, "I'm so grateful to you guys for thinking of me for this." You know, it's just, they don't get those kind of offers a lot. So yeah, um, that's they, true. Yeah. And so when you're doing a movie like Horrible Bosses, it must be um, just a great atmosphere on the set because you're just trying to be funny. And uh, Yeah, well, especially with those three, with Charlie Day and Sudeikis and, and Bateman, it was just a lot of it was riffing. And so it was us. We were on set a lot, sort of they would go in a certain direction. Then we would go up with some pitches and, you know, because it's yeah. always morphing into something a little different. But yeah, it was super fun. And and each day, it was all—it was actually when, when you could shoot in LA, which was so nice, because I'd go from my house to the set, and you know, wasn't like being out of town. The, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Jason Bateman, because he's so underrated as a comedian. He has his own, I was saying at the top of the show, he, you know, even though he slogged through so many of these, or, you know, television shows, none of it, he doesn't have any baggage from that. He yeah. totally reinvented himself yes. and he has a complete kind of underplaying quality that is so unique and funny. It is. And it's a pleasure to write for. Once you have his voice in your head, uh -huh. you just know it's, it's like he's got a toolkit and you know the kinds of tools he's going to pull out for that particular moment. And uh -huh. we always joke, there's a line in Game Night um, where uh, one of the guys brings this not very smart girl to the game and she says something he doesn't like. And he says to her, is that right, Madison? <laughs> and the, the way he puts Madison on the offbeat, it's like me, it's like jazz, you know, because there's an obvious way you deliver that line, but he does it in this weird way. And it's always a little bit weird with him. And it's yeah. always so weird, it's always so funny. Um, and then on the other hand, he does Ozark, which is like, he said that's like the closest to who he really is. I think that's uh -huh. that character. Uh -huh. uh -oh. <laughs> oh dear. So I don't, I don't think he's a criminal, but he does, you know, there's certainly, there's a, there is a darkness to Jason that, that comes through the comedy. Um, he's never going to play like the giddy dumb guy that's just not in his wheelhouse. Well, that's why I say I'm fascinated by, again, somebody who's a child actor who has seen a lot of darkness and you know it's there, but he's compartmentalized it, you know, so he's able to utilize it yet it hasn't really affected him in any way. I, yeah. I really admire that, you know? Well, and he's also, he's the consummate professional. I remember on, on Horrible Bosses, he would, um, even before he was directing anything, he was so aware of where the camera was. He knew every crew member's name, which was really impressive because actors typically don't. And so he would always be aware of, okay, so you're getting me from here to here. Is, this, is it this tight? Okay. And then he would only act inside that frame. Like he knew what the camera was catching and he would just be masterful, but he also knew what he didn't need to do. Yes, I I have to say, when girls do that, they get upset. <laughs> I can mm -hmm. tell it. Unfortunately, I've had, right. I've told that story on the on the show before, where I would always, because I was always trained in my early movies that knowing the director would always tell you what the you know very excitedly tell you what the shot was going to be, and so then on every movie I would say. What's now, what's the shot going to be? What's the lens? And they would be like, what do you care what the lens is? <laughs> they get very irritated about that. Uh -huh. um, okay, let's move into um, uh, Vacation with Ed Helms. Yeah. And uh, how did that come your way? Well, uh, because we had a relationship with New Line, they asked us if we wanted to, to write the movie. And we said we would. And then after we wrote it, they knew that we wanted to try and... Uh, segue into directing and they we talked you know we kind of made a whole pitch of what we would do how it would look um and they said all right you're directing it and then 
they pushed it for a year. We were supposed to go a year before and for various reasons, I think because I think we'd written it as a PG-13 and they were like, let's make it an R. So we made it an R and then a year later we got to do it. Um, and it was probably the most fun I've had on any movie I've worked on because the, the cast, everybody was a sweetheart. I mean, Ed and Christina and the kids yeah. and we had Chris Hemsworth come in for a few days with Charlie Day. We had all these great, every few weeks, somebody new would come in. It was just hilarious and, and weird. And the goal of that movie was not high art. It was just to make the funniest, silliest thing we could. And so it was just a blast. The, uh, I know somebody had asked on the Twitter just about, you know, again, the baggage of, of a franchise that people yeah. knew before. And was there any concern going into There was, it? for sure. Yeah, I mean, we, I'm an enormous fan of the original Vacation. I grew up on Chevy and all of that. And so, you know, we took it very seriously. Um, and, and we insisted on having him and Beverly D'Angelo in the movie playing those roles. It just didn't feel right to not have them. Yeah. And I think that the movie, had it not had the baggage of the, the previous movies and the affection and nostalgia people feel for those, I think we would have gotten a better reaction. I think people were really ready to hate this because when a lot of time goes by and you reboot something, they just assume, okay, this is a, a cash grab and it's going to be crappy. And right. I don't know that we got a fair shake. A lot of people go back and they watch it now and they're like, you know, that's a really funny movie. I didn't and why it got so ream. It's a it's not a critics movie. We knew that. But you know. Well, what are those critics now? That's right. Now, I'd love to ask though quickly. Sure. Um, the original iteration you had written was like a PG thirteen version. Um, do you feel like taking it in the direction of an R rated film affected like your vision for the film when the studio kind of got their hands on it? In some ways. I mean I think that the original the original film was rated R. Not uh, not because it's especially raunchy. It's because there was no PG-13 when the original came out. And so it had enough sexual stuff in it and implications that they made it an R. Um, but I, do, I think that R-rated gives you more freedom in comedy, for sure. You know, and you don't... We did definitely put in some stuff just for the raunch of it. Some of which, looking back, I think we went too far. Um, but no, it didn't hurt it. I think it allowed us to go a little further with some of the stuff. I, I have a question about that. When you're, when somebody says make it R, like what do you what do you do? You just go to a yeah. blackboard and go, hey, this would be wrong. This would yeah. be wrong. You know, like I, I I'm I mean I don't know you that well, but I I would think that some of that stuff would not would not come naturally. You know, you have yeah. to Google like, stuff. No, I don't, <laughs> it's not like I we go up to you know go to like uh, catalogs of porn or, uh, or, or filth, but it does let you think, okay, if we have a set piece, how can we blow it out even more, go further with it and get maybe grosser with it or like make it more adult. Like that four, there's a four corner sequence where they go to have sex on the four corners. And so we added nudity to that, which it yeah. didn't need to have, but it allowed us to go crazier with it. But it's bad if you're like, just if you're trying to get an R rating, it, it often can end up being not a quality result yeah i agree somewhere along the way some of the movies it was like it, it felt forced you know um, the raunchiness felt forced yeah and just not funny well if you like i've been showing my my son who's eight who shouldn't be watching a lot of these movies but i showed him like my favorite movies from the 80s and stuff and so i showed him stripes recently and uh -huh. there's a scene where john larroquette's got the telescope watching the girls in the shower and it's so gratuitous with the soap <laughs> and the, it's like porkies you know yeah, so out of keeping with what that movie is. Somebody it's funny though. Oh, go ahead. I, uh, I kind of miss, like, I feel like in the 90s, and I, I gotta say, first of all, we're gonna get to Game Night, but I think that's a masterful film. I love that movie. I'm excited to talk about it with you, but when I look at, like, what kind of raised me on comedy, it's a lot of Adam Sandler 90s flicks. I look at, like, a Billy Madison. I love Happy Gilmore. And I kind of feel like that PG 13 comedy doesn't exist anymore. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, it is a it's a it's a hard target to hit in terms of studio movies and, and yeah. to market because because older kids won't go well, teenagers feel like ah that's for little kids you know they want an R comedy and younger younger people technically can't go so it's it has become a riskier proposition to do PG thirteen comedies um, you know Game Night 
we were very careful not to do, there's very little raunchy. There's a couple adult sort of sexual references in it, but other than the swearing and a little bit of violence, there's no reason that had to be an R comedy. So that was one where, you know, it. I think what it is is when you do a PG-13, you're changing reality a little bit because people don't talk like they do in the real world. In R, you can talk like a person. And that's really the, the limitation. That's interesting. Yeah. The uh, and another person asked a question before we get into game night. Uh, why do comedy writers structure in a, a character learning a lesson? <laughs> Is that yeah, I think that's not just in comedy. I think that you, when you're coming up with a story of any movie, um, you, there's always an arc they talk about to that character, right. they start somewhere, and probably you want them to end up a little different from where they started. Otherwise, you tend to feel as an audience, why did I watch this? You know, like nothing right. changed. Some great movies, nobody changes, and that's fine too. Um, but I think you want to have- Scorsese. You wanna have, you, Scorsese, you want to have the events be interesting enough that they have an effect on the character, and that's all it is. Yeah. The uh, Okay, so let's get to game night. Now, one of the most amazing, first of all, before I get it, did you ever see the Michael Douglas movie, The Game? Of course, yeah. The, the, uh, did it influence you at all when you were writing the script? Um, That's the only well, other movie I know that has a game that may yeah. or may not be real. Yeah, well, Clue is also another one they reference a lot. Um, but yeah, the game, the game and the whole Fincher style was very much influential in, in this. Um, uh, the story came from a, a writer named Mark Perez, and he had some some of the cool uh, twists that are in there were already in the script when it came to us. We we did a major overhaul on a lot of the characters, on um, on most of the set pieces, on the tone of it overall. It was a little more raunchy, and we wanted to make it really more sort of relatable to average folks who have game nights. Um, but it was. Um, what, what we loved about it were the twists because you know you don't see that very often in a comedy most most comedies really just are pretty predictable mm -hmm. and the plot you're following is almost secondary to the jokes and the, the mm -hmm. set piece, the bits and we wanted to make sure that we had a story that even if you stripped all the jokes away would be a fun ride yes that was so that was super fun but yeah the game the game is is so much fun to watch because you're as an audience put in the position of just not knowing what's real and what isn't and you and doing that in comedy is a blast too. Well, you know, it's interesting because we were talking about genres that don't really exist. And my sweet spot when I was growing up was thrillers, you know, like Three Days of the Condor. I, oh my God, I, you know, the Parallax View. Yeah. And so the game, what I like about Game Night is it manages to combine both being a comedy, a satisfying comedy and a satisfying thriller. Right, that was very, very much the intention. It's why we got Cliff Martinez to do the music. It's why it's all kind of, darker than the average comedy and the camera moves are very um, smooth and program programmed and you know Fincher-esque for lack of a better word um, that that was what we love is having the audience not be sure what the movie is at least for some of it yes and you invented I want to get this right an R what is this an R one-arm camera rig I, we did not invent it but no, we you, didn't, were, you used we were, it on the movie we did use it we were early what is an R1 camera rig I'm already it's, excited it's a super cool rig so it attaches to the back or front of a car and it's this carbon fiber arm that sticks out 20 feet with the camera on the end of it and then you digitally remove the arm so it's mounted to the car and it moves with the car it looks like a video game when you're playing wow you know, a driving game. And so yeah. it's used in that chase where they're chasing, uh, being chased by the bad guys and also when they're chasing down the airplane. So it's a very unique looking thing. So is this something like they do in movie, movies like Fast and Furious that they would use in that or? They typically have moving cameras more. They use um, an ultimate arm, which is a thing that attaches to a car, usually a Porsche Cayenne that runs alongside their cars. And then that arm moves around the car and stuff like that. But I guess because when you mount it, it's a very specific looking thing. It's not dynamic in the way that Fast and Furious yeah. wants to be. I think. Aren't driving scenes very hard, very challenging? Yeah. Well, they are um, because you're typically shooting the inside on a stage and the outside, you know, in the real world at night, some of it's second unit. So we couldn't even be there for some of those things. And then yeah. your editor has to be really good at chopping it together in a way that the audience can see what's going on. And the, the geography of it. Yeah. 
Well, you were we very had, brave. Yeah, well, and we had to, you know, we, the, a window breaks and the glass falls on Bateman at one point. And so we used, you know, there's the fake glass. And so we rehearsed with the actors like on chairs and told them, we told them, okay, now you're going to lean this way. Okay. And then it goes back this way. You know, it's a lot of that. So. <laughs> no, it's, cha it's challenging. Um, another thing that you said was that you wanted to have a strong comedic female lead. You didn't want to have a woman like the wife rolling her eyes at yeah. the stuff that her husband was doing. So talk about a little bit about the casting of Rachel McAdams. Well, she was our first choice from the beginning, just because um, we knew she could do comedy really well. She's also someone who doesn't get to do a ton of comedy. Obviously, she, you know, Wedding Crashers like, or Mean Girls. Um, yeah. And she um, also brings a confidence and, a, and a, like a strength to the role that she could she could hold her own against Bateman because he could be an intimidating figure. Um, they felt like a like a couple to us, and uh, but yeah, the point was all to not do the standard sitcommy wife thing, which is rolling her eyes while the husband does stupid things. We wanted her to do her share of stupid things, and so like the the bullet removal uh, originally that was a different character in the original script. It was. Bateman worked at a gym and he had this macho boss and the boss takes the bullet out, something like that. And so we gave that to Rachel's character because we just thought that would be a great moment for husband and wife, you know, for her to have to be tough and power through this disgusting thing she has to do. The, uh, did you have any, like, uh, do you have like a favorite day on the set of shooting? Like what was, I mean, you're both directing it. Yeah. Um, trying to think, I mean, there were, there were a lot of really fun, great moments. I mean, that cast really popped when they were all together. I'd say some of the stuff in that Kyle Chandler kind of mansion, you know, where he's laying out the game and then Jeffrey Wright comes in. We had such, such great actors coming in for short bits of time. And when they were all like firing on all cylinders, it was just super fun to sit behind the monitors and watch it. When you're bringing in an actor for a short cameo, how do you make sure that the tone is universal? Like sometimes an actor comes in and, you know, yeah, they could be way off base of what right. everybody else is doing. Well, and so, and so, you know, you typically, you want to, you talk generally about the movie and the tone, and then you, you kind of let them do what they're going to do for the first tape. And if it's not in the right ballpark, <laughs> you, you, you gently prod them into the ballpark you want them to get. Like, what would be an example? What is your general hint? Well, What's I mean, Je Jeffrey, you know, Jeffrey knew he was doing a comedy. So I think he, he, uh, his first approach to it was probably a little broader than we wanted. And so, you know, we said to him, now you are a, you're a bad actor. And that's, you're a bad actor playing an FBI agent, but you take it very seriously, you know? And so I think it got him to get it into his head. Like, okay, I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to pretend this isn't a comedy. And that was for game night. That was the approach we told all the actors just forget you're in a comedy um game, game night is a perfect to watch during quarantine has anyone brought that up it's that is like what? as game night game night is a perfect movie to watch during while we're quarantined mm -hmm. has anyone uh i've heard i've seen a lot of people tweeting about it they're sort of discovering it um yeah but yeah no it's it's you know it's a frustrating thing because it came out uh the weekend after black panther and I always remember having a conversation with a guy who was at the time the head of Warner Brothers uh, distribution. They scheduled the movies and he's saying, I don't think Black Panther's gonna, uh, gonna do much business. <laughs> <laughs> and so it made it made a hundred, I think 110 million in its second weekend. So he was wrong. Your movie had good word of mouth. It did. We had a great, we would get an email from New Line every uh, Monday, Sunday, I think it was, saying like, this is the lowest drop in New Line history from week to week, which was really great to see. What was the choice about the poster? To, to not have anybody, you know, really be featured on the poster? We didn't want, well, it's funny, because there is an overseas poster, which has Jason and, and Rachel and the, and the dog. It's a pretty standard looking poster. Yeah. We like the idea of an art poster more, uh, because it was, the movie is so um, threading the needle between genres, like you said. Yeah. Any, any comedy poster tends to be, you know, the actors back to back with each other and a you know, <laughs> little look to the camera and just hate all that stuff. And so we wanted something that could be a little weird, uh, could be interpreted in different ways. Yeah, it did. It was much more like a thriller than a, than a yeah. comedy. 
Well, the poster we liked that Warner Brothers didn't sign off on it. The first poster they showed us we loved was a, um, a gun made of game pieces, entirely of game pieces. It was really cool. Ooh, I like that. Crazy. Yeah. But for whatever reason, it didn't. So t t tell me about this movie now. Oh, would there ever be a sequel to Game Night? You know, I think New Line would, would welcome one. I don't know that we want to do it. Um, I just feel like it, it. Was nice, it was nicely self-contained. Yeah. Um, and I, I there's very few comedy sequels I know of that are better than the first. That's true. It's, I have a couple of Game Night questions too before I move on to Dungeons and Leon, if that's all right. Yeah. I I think Jesse Plemons in Game Night is like, just like a masterful per, like performance. Did, on yeah. set, did you guys know you had something magical with him? Even before set, we had a we had a table read in LA before we went to Atlanta to shoot it, and I laughed so hard my my ribs were hurting because he was <laughs> so committed and serious. He was doing what we had said hoped people would do, which is take it seriously. And yeah, he's such a good actor, and to see this ridiculous character handled so artfully was just a joy yeah and then we did you know on set we would um we when he's at the mailbox we were always pushing in very slowly on him <laughs> as if what he's saying is ominous but it's just boring <laughs> yeah. yeah did you guys ever get nervous i mean you talked about game night is this threading of genres it's one of the reasons i like the movie one of the reasons like i hope we're able to protect the original standalone comedy feature like i'm afraid those are going away and i'd love to hear you speak on that but were you ever nervous on set, like, this might not be funny. Like, we're directing a thriller. I hope this is funny. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, we were always a little terrified because um, we had the vision in our head of what it was supposed to be. But the question of whether that would translate to audiences was anybody's guess. And the mm -hmm. first people you screen your movie for are the marketing people, typically, at the studio. So you go into a screening room on the lot and, you know, 10 marketing people come in. And they're not the greatest audience. We showed it to them, and they get up and they're like, "Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff there." And we're like, "Oh fuck, this is it. we we blew it. Like this is going to be a total disaster." But we realized, like, no, they were just a bad audience, and like people were getting it. So yes, it was a scary. It's always scary when you're trying to do something unusual. I mean, you're talking, you know, you talk about thrillers, Ileana. I also love horror comedies. Are rare and hard to pull off. American Werewolf in London. Is such a fine film and so yeah. such a tough needle to thread. Um, yeah, that's true. Horror comedy is another genre that doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. Now everything is. Was Joker supposed to be a horror comedy? No, it was meant to be a serious uh, psychodrama. I think that was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think I expected it. Yeah. I was like, this is dark. <laughs> yeah. This is like too dark. Do yeah. you. So when you're thinking of a movie, do you want to, do you have to fight? Like, do you always want to do stuff with Jason Bateman because he seems to understand your rhythm and the way you work so well? I mean, Jason is, Jason's that rare bird because he straddles comedy and drama in a very effective way. Not a lot of people do that as well. Um, for us, I mean, I think we love, as far as comedy goes, we love bringing dramatic actors into comedies and having them just play it straight like Jesse. Yeah. Um, and in looking at Dungeons and Dragons now, like we're thinking of some pretty Shakespearean kind of guys, you know, like we don't want to get the, it, we don't want it to be the, the stable of comedy people. Um, but, but, you know, the broader thing for us, my partner and I is that we love cross genre things, things that right. don't fall neatly into one category. Um, and so that's what we hope D and D, which is to um, reinvent the fantasy medieval movie a little bit you know, and not make it, it's not a spoof. It's not really a comedy, but it's certainly hopefully funny in a lot of places. The, uh, so there was a, there was one Dungeons and Dragons made, right? In two Yeah, in 2000 or 2001, there was a movie. I haven't seen it. I kind of don't want to see it. It's, it's a famously unliked movie. Yeah. Well, that was the era of like the Dark Crystal and, yeah. right? Wasn't it the, Everything was sort of a Vaseline lensed. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that there's a, like a kind of a tropey way to make fantasy movies that a lot of people kind of went in for just super serious. And I don't know, that only takes you so far. So you're working on the, so you have the script done and you're thinking about cast or you're thinking about cast as you write we the have, script? We have, we have the script done. 
we're addressing some notes now and, and rewriting a few bits, parts of it. We're talking about cast. Um, and we're even, you know, seeing art. We have artists working on all sorts of things for us, um, talking about locations and where we might shoot it. And, um, you know, we were supposed to be pretty far along in prep, if not for COVID. So right. we'll have to see, you know, what happens in terms of when we can open up again. But we're moving in a good direction. So that's an interesting question. How does that impact your writing crowd scenes and, uh, yeah, we're, we're talking about that today actually because we had the crowds and uh yeah i don't i honestly don't know i would hate to be like where there's this two three year period where movies come out and they all look shitty because all the crowds are cg and people can't get close to each other Hopefully yeah that won't happen. where you compromise your vision and then everything is okay yeah um i, no, I don't we're, know we're, we're not we're not addressing it in the writing now. We'll see if we have to do something, if we go into production, you know, what the reality is. But they're already, it's weird. They're sending out, some of the studios are sending out like protocols of how they expect to move forward. There's not gonna be craft service. They're gonna hand you a sealed thing. And you know, hair and makeup are the only ones who can touch the actor and blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. My $60,000, uh, whatever comment about that, I saw some of those too, is like, Okay, but then what happens when the actor takes the mask off to act in the scene? I know. And Is that all for good. naught? I guess the the cast would be sort of like a family sheltering together. You know, they expose each other, but they don't, they talk about like you can't be near your family and stuff. I mean, I'm not going to do that, but. You're going to go, yeah, that sounds like Dungeons and Dragons in itself. You're going to go <laughs> off and. A, put us in a hotel somewhere and. Yeah, and it's like a movie within a movie. Yeah, exactly. Just like when you said, I hope that the movies aren't compromised. I also hope there aren't a bunch of movies that go, he moved in because he had the COVID. Yeah, I know. Right. It'll really tarnish the movie if a lot of people died in the making of it. <laughs> oh, my God. No, I know. Like nobody, nobody, um, nobody knows. Or again, do you, do you seal, do you put plexiglass around the scene? <laughs> yeah that's another, way to, that's another way to do it. it it's very uh challenging though i can't you know i, I can't imagine that i know yeah so were you a dungeons and dragons fan growing up i did again it's a phenomenon that missed me somehow play. yeah it was um it was a lot of nerdy boys in the 70s i was one of those my brother was definitely my brother was was very into it i played a little bit um my partner plays now actually john has a weekly game uh which is now moved online but um well, it's trending right isn't it trending yeah. on twitter everybody's like it's a had a real resurgence you know we, we we saw this document from the uh the company that, that controls uh D, D, and this past year was their biggest in all 45 years of their existence in terms of wow. sales of games and everything it's yeah. you know whatever it is in the culture it's a combination of stranger things and yeah you know, but not just that I think there's a real hunger for offline imagination games. Um, mm -hmm. And where, you know, our movie is, it tries to tap into the spirit of D&D, &D, I think. It's it's really a, a movie, of, you know, about a group of people going on a quest, like a group of kids playing a game would, you know, and so that's, that's the touchstone for us. Is it a contemporary film or does it take place in the past? Um, it, uh, it is not contemporary. Other than that, you sound very secretive. Okay. Okay. Well, we have nothing's been said about this, and so. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's Everyone. all. I, that's all I can. Sorry. Nobody watches this show. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we run out of time, do you remember the first movie that you saw and who took you to see it? The very first movie I saw. Hmm. Um, I remember. One of the earliest, most traumatizing movies I saw was uh, we would, my parents were divorced. My dad lived in Manhattan and we'd go stay with him on the weekends. And we would always watch the uh, Sunday movie on WOR, the million dollar movie, I think it yes. was. And, yeah. uh, and they showed the Phantom of the Opera, the original Phantom of the Opera. Oh my God. When he took that mask off, it, that's burned into my brain. Like I, uh, I never quite recovered from that. So, Jonathan, I have the exact same memory. Really? I, yeah, my dad was sleeping on the couch and I couldn't sleep. I was upstairs and I couldn't sleep. And I crawled 
downstairs and the television was on and I walked into the living room and it was the moment. That's bad timing. And I screamed <laughs> and for years afterwards, that was my boogeyman. Yeah, I think I also remember, remember going to see Gremlins by myself in the theater. I was like, I don't know, 11. I was too young to see it alone, I think. And that was also scarier than I thought it was gonna be. Yeah. It's weird how the scary movies are the ones you <laughs> stick with you. But I also, you know, I, I was of that age where uh, we just got, like HBO was brand new. Mm -hmm. and we didn't have a VCR, we didn't have a ton of money, but we got HBO and I would watch Airplane about a hundred times and I would record my favorite parts on a tape recorder. Like, yeah. The, uh, are those the comedies that really um, influenced you? Like what are your, some of your favorite comedy? Yeah. For me, it was that those things that combine absurdity with intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, Monty Python being probably the most, the best example of that, the way that it yeah. was, I didn't get half the jokes, the references and things, but I just, I thought it was hilarious. Um, and then, and then Woody Allen, the whole canon of Woody Allen was very, I mean, I saw Annie Hall a million times. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, like some of that Zucker Brothers and Abrams and, you know, that was also, I just loved how dumb it was and crazy and rapid fire, a movie like Airplane. Were you an Albert Brooks fan at all? Like the kind of uncomfortable comedy? Yeah, but I was, I was a bit older by the time his, most of it, you know, Mother and, and Defending Your Life and Lost in America. I love Lost in America. Um, yeah, me too. That was... Yeah, no, I, I could watch those a million times as well. Did you ever want to break, like, is there a feeling that, I mean, you're so successful in the genre that you are in. Do you want to stay within that genre? Or at a certain point, do you want to make a personal film or, or make a very serious film, a small budget film? Right. Um, well, you know, my... John and I have, have worked pretty hard to not let ourselves be pigeonholed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, at the beginning it was all comedy, but then, you know, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming came our way because uh, we actually went in there and pitched ourselves to direct it. And we got up to the last three and uh, and they, they went with another director, but they loved what we had pitched and they said, you write it. And so we were like, fine, we'll write Spider-Man Homecoming. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so that was an opportunity to, you know, do something very different, real action, you know, uh, high budget kind of a thing, but but also instill it with the things that we love, which was real characters, real kids, some funny bits and pieces, and also keeping it kind of grounded and not not becoming like an Avengers movie. We wanted to be mm -hmm. small, contained. So that's an example of doing something that's outside our comfort zone for sure, but trying to make it our own, as it were. Um, but, but yes, I mean, we would love game night was great for not, it, it was financially successful and it got really good reviews. And so that was the Holy grail for, for us, you know, like, how do you do that? Um, it's, it's rare to be able to do that. So I would love to, to, to be able to do both going forward. Well, I think it's rare, especially for an original studio comedy. You know, I mentioned like I, Adam Sandler was sort of my touchstone when I was a kid. Um, but I feel like it is harder and harder to find original non-franchise like mid-budget films yeah. um like i i feel like you're one of the few directors who can like direct like a 40 million dollar movie like i feel like that's really not happening much anymore it, yeah. do you feel like that's an important like sort of film touchstone to try to protect because to me i really love those movies yeah well you know it's it's a difficult moment we're in because the question is do those movies go to the movie theaters assuming movie theaters reopen are people going to pay 15 bucks or whatever it is, 18 bucks to go see a mid budget movie that they can probably see on their TV at home if they wait a week or three or five or whatever it is, you know? So it becomes a harder model for the studios. I mean, we get sent script after script and it's almost entirely existing intellectual property as they call it. Yeah. It's very rare that it's what you're talking about, which is a mid-level original because they're terrified of, of making those. Netflix will make those for sure, but the studios i don't know hmm. yeah that's interesting that's where we that uh, no, nobody knows you know i i'm betting that there'll be a group of people that want to go to the movies and it'll slowly come back but again yeah. you know I certainly hope so i would hate to be the last generation that had movie theaters you know God. well the handshake is gone what are you gonna yeah and the buffet the buffet is gone i'll miss the handshake 
or the hug. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna miss. I'm I'm gonna miss some of those those things. Uh, what have you been doing during quarantine? Have you been watching any movies or shows or anything? Yeah, I have. I mean, it's funny because I've been working pretty much as much as I ever do because the way that my partner and I have always written is online. He at his house, me at my house. I'm on Skype and we share the screen. Mm -hmm. So we've been between the TV show and Dungeons and Dragons and there's a couple other things we may do some writing on. Um, that's been a full day's work. So that, that part hasn't changed too much. But yeah, I mean, I definitely am. Uh, I'm finding some relief in in online and in, in streaming movies and TV shows. I just, I've been loving The Last Dance, which is that documentary. I'm not a sports guy at all, but uh, I'm finding it fascinating. Just the, it's almost like an epic tale of the, the bulls in that year. Um, movie wise, I just watched Hemsworth and Extraction, which apparently is a big deal on Netflix. It's- Okay, uh, and I miss, how do you, there's 8,000 movies. It's like, <laughs> you think you're up and then you go, what's that? No. This is like the craziest, the most successful Netflix movie in history, apparently. He's like, a, you know, mercenary goes in and extracts kidnapped victims. Okay. And, uh, so it's, it's a silly movie, but but it's it's good COVID watching. Uh, I like <laughs> COVID uh, watching, COVID sampling. Yes. Um, the, uh, I still, I, I go, do you watch Criterion Channel at all? Is that your um, real house? No, I we have it, but I haven't been watching lately. Uh, I'll walk in. My wife watches a lot of a lot of older movies all the time. I used to go as a kid, as a teenager. Actually, I would go every I think every Friday night with a friend to this repertory cinema. I was living in Cleveland, Ohio. It's called the New Mayfield, and we would watch a double feature of movies from the '30s, '40s, '50s, like just hours of consuming stuff. Did you ever have an experience, you know, like that cliche experience where you're talking to a studio head or pitching something and you say it's like Humphrey Bogart in Treasure Sierra Madre and they just look at you like that. Yeah, well sadly I'm finding I'm often the oldest person in the room now. <laughs> like when I go to meetings. So I have to I have to modulate my references. Uh, <laughs> it helps to have an eight-year-old to keep you a bit current and a partner who's younger than you. Um, but yeah, no, there is there is that. It's it can be a bit of a bummer. I have a 24-year-old assistant who I'm she she's pretty aware of stuff, but she'll like ask me, and I'll give her recommendations for like must see. Yeah. It freaks me out whenever I'm on when I work on a set. Nobody knows who anybody is. Every every reference I have is like doesn't <laughs> yeah. doesn't go over. What have you seen lately? Anything you love? Well, I've been uh, I've been writing this book, um, a movie book. So I, I have to watch a lot of old movies for that. So I've been. Uh, exploring the work of a director named Delmer Daves. He did a lot of, uh, he worked interestingly enough in a lot of genres, Westerns. Um, he did 60s teen films, which was sort of underrated film. So I've been looking at a lot of that, a lot of those movies, a movie called um, The Red House with Edward G. Robinson. So there are always like a lot of old movies that nobody knows about, but I like going I sort of like going to the past and then catching up with the future. Like I wa I do sample everything that's out, you know, so I watched billions. Mm -hmm. It's just so far out of my, yeah. what I, you know, for me, my sweet spot is old movies, but then I take the day off and I watch, you know, shows like billions and I haven't seen tiger King yet. Uh, I'm yeah. a little nervous about the animal. Yeah, it's fine. It's I think one episode will give you the I, idea. I mean, I do love watching writers and like Billions has, a, I love the writing in Billions. It's so far away from any kind of world that I would ever be able to write about mm -hmm. that I enjoy sometimes watching. Do you, do you ever have that experience? You go, I could never write anything like that. So sure. I enjoy watching. No, the whole, the whole work of, of David Simon, for example, I mean, The Wire, I love how it demands so much of the viewer. You know, you have to really pay attention. Half the time you have no idea what they're talking about, but you piece it together. It doesn't, it doesn't dumb it down for the audience. And it's fascinating that way. I love how real it is. Yeah. Do you borrow from writers at all? Do you have your own distinct voice? I'd say I try not to borrow from writers, um, but definitely 
will take bits and pieces of inspiration from the things that come before for sure or stylistic choices um yeah i think as a writer you never want to just like lift something but um unless you're there, ryan murphy <laughs> Unless, well, for Hollywood, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. I was the I, I was mentioning at the top of the show. I was like, oh, eight other people's stories uh -huh. put into one. That's funny. Well, what we, I'll say what we do do is um, we draw on stuff we've done in other movies. We we repurpose it. So it's kind of fun sometimes. Yeah, yeah. There's certain things that run through our movies, like little phrases and little bits of business that tend to recur. Little is there any actors that you want to work with? I mean, you don't have to mention anyone that you're trying to get. Yeah. Are there any actors you go, oh my God, I'd love to write for that person? I mean, Christian Bale, someone who I think can do just about anything. And uh, Have you ever met him? He seems very intimidating. He's very intense, but no, I think he's friendly. We, we were at the early screening of Vice, um, which was such an incredible transformation that I saw him there and he's like 60 pounds. I mean, it's just incredible that he, he can do that. But um, what about somebody like Russell Crowe? Would you be intimidated? I met with Russell Crowe for a movie we we're going to direct years ago, and uh, he was pretty much what you'd expect. Very brusque, very you know, kind of doesn't seem I'd, like that. I'd be so scared. Yeah, that's it. I'd be it's like, a, I'd be like a little dog that goes like, don't hurt me. Yeah. No, it's it's a bit intimidating, but um, you have to get on your macho suit. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's always also a balance because certain actors. I'm not saying Russell would be one, but certain actors, you know, they're not going to do quite what you want them to do. They're going to bring whatever they want to the party and you either are going to fight <sighs> them or, you know, it's just going to be, it's not going to be happy go lucky. Do you know that in the casting process and decide, okay, is it worth it to, to, cause I've certainly met people that I go, wow, it's going to be an uphill. Yeah. For yeah. sure. There's a, there's a life's too short reputation that follows some people and you have to decide. Yeah. I mean, we were offered, not offered, but we were asked to consider directing a, a pretty big franchise movie. And we knew the guy starring in it was going to be horrible. And we were just like, nah, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. All right. Well, unfortunately, Jonathan, after all these years, we'll see, always have Pittsburgh. In 16 years. <laughs> I hope we see, I hope we see each other before that, before, uh, oh. Before then, I'm around. I mean, I live in LA, but every time I'm, I go out, people go, oh, how long are you here for it? I know, you, I feel, I okay, you feel like a New Yorker. I don't yeah. know, it's a compliment. They have the accent, I guess. But, um, but anyway, it's been totally awesome uh, talking with you and continued success on Thank your you. movies. And, um, and your wife is a writer too, right? She is. She's a novelist. Yeah, she wrote a number of... Uh, of uh, what they call chick lit novels that were published in 20 something countries and, and stuff. So she, we've been trying to turn a couple of them into movies. They're kind of ready made for that. So it's just about uh -huh. finding the right package, you know, to do that. Do you share material at all or do you Sometimes. stay? Well, I was, I was going to be a producer on uh, an adaptation of one of her books into a series, uh -huh. um, but yeah, I always give her my stuff to read and, you know, oh, she give me her. Thanks yeah. so much for having me. Yeah, this was really fun. It was a total blast. Let's stay in touch. Uh, hopefully this will all end soon and we can all get back to work. It'd be great. Yeah. All right. Thank all right. you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. All right. Take care. Have a great day. So long. And as we end our show today, as we always say, everybody's life is like a movie with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And this is the end of our show for today. Jeff, fantastic to see you. I, I know. I hope it's in person soon, Ileana. I know. I know. I hope, I, I I hope to see you soon. Yes, sounds good. We'll be continuing to have great guests on the show. Have a great day, everyone. Mwah. Virtual kiss and a hug. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network.